good morning, and it is a pleasure to be here. We have a number of uh, panel discussants, and what I would like to do is ask uh, the nine of them, is it nine? eight of them, to come on up now. If you could come up now, don't be shy. <laughs> have a seat at, at your um, placard there. And what I would like to do is give your name and, and country and just have you say a word or two about uh, your particular interest. Then we'll move into formal uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, that you brought uh, from your country. <laughs> for me to be here today and share some information with you. Thank you. Uh, fourth is Dr. Emily Koech, a, a colleague from uh, Kenya, and she gave me a, a uh, piece when we left of a woman warrior from Kenya. It's very nice. <laughs> nice thing. Thank you for that, Emily. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having us. Okay. Uh, next, next is Dr. Abu Abu. Abu uh, Um Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure as usual to be here. It's not the first time, it's a multiple time, but it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, next, Dr. Uh, uh, Don Thanga uh, from CBD Mali. Dr. Thanga? No, from Malawi. I can't read these days. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here today. It's my first time in the University of America. Thank you. Uh, uh, my friend from uh, Botswana, Dr. Ndwapi. Ndwapi? Ndwapi? <laughs> thank you. It's a good thing you come from Australia. Good uh, understand. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and it's a pleasure to be here. And, and last, Dr. Rob Schoenberger from Zambia. Rob? Good morning, and it's a pleasure to be here and participate in this collaborative effort for the World Bank Board. Okay, so I guess, Gamba, um, uh, we're going to start with you. Uh, and do we have this who's managing the slides? Not me, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Ramon Liu. I serve as um, University of Maryland Programs Country Director in Nigeria. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to apply brevity to all the slides because I have been for one that uh, Dr. Joro is very strict with time. So, details can follow later. Thank you. Um, all right, sorry. I will be sharing with you our grant supports, um, what we have been doing with those grants, what we have achieved with those grants, and um, what we have going forward as well as um, challenges we're facing or challenges we have encountered and how probably how we're able to uh, overcome some of them. As you can see from the slides, um, the first three things you'll see, and forget about the acronyms, we'll we come to it later. Um, our grants that are ongoing. Um, cumulatively, we're looking at uh, $84 million uh, that is almost gone. And if you look at coming grants, these are grants that we are expecting this year, and we expected something to the tune of about $30 million. 
Thank you. All right, in terms of accomplishment, um, the major accomplishment as we have had, um, uh, and you will hear also from me and from other speakers of University of Midland programs in Nigeria, is um, supporting Nigeria's HIV response uh, uh, and then health system strengthening. And this is in the area of HIV program evaluation, um, national data repository, and this surveillance system, and the recently concluded Nigeria AIDS indicator impact survey. The National Data Repository, this is an offshoot from one of the grants that I have shown, it says SHIELD grant, okay, which is basically evaluation and system strengthening. Um, we started by creating a data system where we look at aggregate numbers, and gradually we progress into looking at individual trajectories. So right now we are having um, a data repository that is providing information about HIV AIDS individuals across Nigeria, um, individuals that are on treatment, how they are fed on treatment, and looking forward to creating a case-based surveillance system um, where we create a system that is akin to data for care here in the United States. Uh, if you, sorry, you, you can see the numbers there uh, in terms of the number of facilities that um, we collect data from nationwide. Um, in terms of the counties that we are, in terms of individuals um, that right now that we have individuals level data as well as um, the hospital visit records as well as pres prescription records. Sorry. And, and, and these things you are seeing um, is a surveillance system that is targeted towards um, global health response and global health security response system. And what this uh, entails to is to create a system that rapidly identifies preventable outbreaks and avoid them uh, by detecting the pathogens that can be detected early when they rear their heads and also provide a rapid response. Uh, what we do um, generally is create a system nationwide where we provide tools to uh, health workers at facilities to report these things, to report events when they occur, to report um, occurrence of um, target babies like uh, cerebral special meningitis, measles, um, cholera and a host of others. So on a daily basis these reports are coming and we have um, event-based surveillance where individuals surf internet and see what is what is going on um, in the community and society level because some of these are reported by media before we even see them. So uh, and we also look at data coming from the laboratories as well as um, antimicrobial consumption. This is um, uh, the separate nationwide in terms of how we were able to get this thing out in the last three to four years. Three, this is the fourth year. Um, as you can see, initially we were only in three states. We deployed to more states and now we have only about eight states remaining. Um, this eight states, we're, we're talking about facilities at community levels, um, giving tools to health workers and teaching them how to report these things, identify them and report them uh, time, near real time. Uh, and here is the, the antimicrobial reporting. Um, this one is a level of deployment, uh, and this is something that we are still working on. Hopefully by next year, we will be all over the country. Uh, okay, this is the, the, what we have started hearing about, the Nigerian AIDS Indicator Impact Survey. It's the largest HIV survey done ever in the world, and in terms of time, the most ambitious. It was done within one year, Previously, other surveys of this magnitude done less magnitude of this were done in three years. Okay, first year plan, second year collect data, and third year report. So this time around, the U.S. government and the Nigerian government uh, have decided that they want this thing in one year, and they told us point blank from the beginning when we got the grant. And it may amaze you to know that this is the first time the University of Maryland was competing for this grant. And the first time we're getting it, and we got it to implement it in the most complex environment in the world, in terms of implementation, physical uh, complexity, and politically the most complex also. So it was very difficult um, implementing this survey. We deployed about 6,000, over 6,000 staff out in the field doing different things at different times. Uh, at the same time, we had over almost 500 vehicles out there in the field and you know moving along this road some of them are not good some of them are not so good and sometimes you know across waters and uh, sometimes across borders and um, 
you know, in terrains that are very, very dangerous. You, you must have known about Nigeria, Boko Haram. You must have known about the northeastern part of Nigeria. You must have known about, have heard about the northwestern part of Nigeria where we have bandits and uh, host of kidnappers. And this. But the glad tidal thing was that we were everywhere, including Chibok. Yeah, in Nigeria, and not a single person was kidnapped, not a single person was attacked, not a single person was killed. So even the government of Nigeria was surprised. So this is <laughs> so the another uh, one unique you, you, unique achievement of this survey, something that came out of this survey that has never been, is the ability to monitor the data that are coming near real time. We are seeing the data as they are streaming from the field. We are looking at errors. We are correcting them as they are coming, and we are cleaning the data for analysis. This is, we have to we have to move at this pace. Uh, so you can imagine how the coordination is going on. And um, <coughs> sorry, there is one slide here that that goes off, but it it, it gives um, uh, a summary, general summary of um, the survey itself in terms of the survey indicators, the vital indicators that we monitor. Throughout the survey, we collected we collected data over 22 weeks. Uh, this is exactly five months, and we are looking at household response rate, um, uh, individual response rate, blood draw response rate. You would have seen if the slide was here. Um, we collected more samples. We we interviewed more than uh, we had uh, targeted. We were in various places as well as security challenge, EAS enumeration areas. Um, but the good thing was that this survey was accomplished in record time. So in terms of challenges that we um, were facing, working with, um, I'm, and I'm sorry if somebody from CDC is here, but working with a funder like CDC, you know, a court agreement where, uh, you know, you have a request from funders that are coming in multiple, in multitude, and sometimes a little bit of hazard man, you know, um, They'll say, okay, we need this tomorrow. They'll say, no, we don't want this. Give us this. So they keep you scattered. And um, this ever changes the scope. And in terms of a funding, uh, short funding cycle, you keep on racing with who do I go with, who do I drop in terms of your staff. So this is constant, things that constantly change because the funding cycle is one year. Um, in terms of application, uh, you know, the application you are, imagine, uh, building application to capture data, you know, uh, from all over Nigeria. You have thousands of uh, tablets out there, you know, capturing data and transmitting data, and now looking at this data. You have servers, about seven servers, you know, some of them are uh, physical, some of them are cloud-based. About three of them, I think, I think they are cloud-based, four of them are physical. You know, managing all this, uh, managing the complexity, the complex data structure was not easy. And the program itself, rapid scale up and scale down. Imagine from 6,000 plus staff, now I'm reduced to about 100 staff. So that, it was challenging actually. And um, to add everything, uh, so, so to add to all this, if you look at your life as an academician, um, you begin to think of what impact has it done to you. For me, it keeps me scattered for the last three years. You know, I cannot organize myself. I cannot even write a paper. It, it was that bad. You know, so that, uh, if, if, if you manage a, a, a program like that, then somebody will have to begin to think of then how do I, how do I deal with these issues, that um, things that I need um, in terms of growth, and perhaps probably the time doesn't come. So, but we are very happy. We are very, we're very happy. We are grateful, you know, and we are proud of what we have achieved. In terms of what we are looking for going forward, the fear model survey, I know you probably must have heard that University of Milan has, has been awarded additional countries to do this fear survey. Um, we will be looking at the regional disease surveillance instead of in, in place of country based surveillance, which means what we started in Nigeria, we are going to now expand it um, to other countries to um, uh, create a system that will early detect preventable um, outbreaks and uh, you know, provide rapid response when they occur. In terms of visualizing data, in terms of creating dashboard, you know, uh, for program monitoring, uh, we will be uh, doing this, you know, for money. You will be doing this to I implementing partners that are there uh, 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 providing HIV program. 
uh, giving them informatic support services and at, 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 at the same time, you know, providing them platform to manage laboratory uh, a data system, a, a field that has not been um, grown and uh, in, in terms of managing data, you know, that are coming from programs of such magnitude, this is really very important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grambo. Dr. Cyprian, we're going to try to stay on time, and if we have time at the end, we'll have questions, okay? Well, bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to, to, speak, to try to speak in English. Um, uh, it, it's a, a, an amazing contrast uh, to the present for Rwanda after Nigeria presentation. Uh, Rwanda is a small country with less than 10% of the Nigerian population. And the one state, uh, Nigeria state, is uh, bigger than Rwanda. But the good news is that this country uh, is one of the countries classified as doing well in terms of controlling the HIV epidemic. So I'm presenting the, uh, on behalf of Rwanda team, which they are here. So I am presenting on, on behalf of, of Rwanda team. Uh, as the country is small, uh, the, the grants are small as well. Since the beginning, uh, uh, EMB is part of the, the HIV management control uh, uh, epidemic in Rwanda uh, since 2005. Uh, Rwanda started 2004 implementing HIV uh, programming, and uh, uh, EMB uh, was granted three grants since uh, this period. The first grant was a relief grant in Track One grant, and the series was the Prime. And uh, EMD was the technical lead. We uh, uh, can see the first grant run from 2005 to 2011. And then uh, uh, we had, at that period, we, we had uh, uh, 20 sites uh, implementing HIV, comprehensive HIV uh, uh, services. And we transitioned uh, those uh, uh, services, those sites, to Ministry of Health at the end of 2011. And then uh, CDC granted uh, or gave the gr uh, grant, a post uh, transition grant, uh, which is called PACME, uh, Partnership uh, for Advanced Clinical Mentorship and, uh, and uh, Education. And then the current grant is a grant uh, which is called a, 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 a above site grant, that means that we are no longer implementing HIV services uh, on site but rather supporting central level. Uh, in terms of uh, accomplishment, um, during its relief uh, period, this grant, we had said, uh, 20 sites, and uh, uh, we, we managed around, uh, uh, we provided services around for 10,000 patients, and uh, at the end of the grant, uh, we did an evaluation and uh, we had the, uh, the highest retention uh, patient uh, with more than 90% of viral suppression. Also, uh, uh, <coughs> we, we transitioned uh, this uh, site to the Ministry of Rwanda on his demand. And uh, uh, this was the first, the first uh, HIV um, program to be transitioned to Ministry of Health. The, the second grant was uh, a, a, a post-transition post grant and it was dedicated to maintain uh, quality services. And uh, uh, most of, most of uh, our activity was, was uh, focusing on uh, you know, uh, uh, development of uh, uh, skills for uh, risk care workers in Rwanda, and uh, also supporting uh, HIV, HIV national guidelines and tools 
uh, is thus based. Uh, the outcome uh, is uh, for the main outcome for this grant was that we were able to support the Ministry of Police Rwanda to establish a national uh, uh, clinical mentorship. Uh, uh, and now Rwanda have uh, uh, extended this uh, this uh, program uh, to all other uh, health program, including maternity and child health. And uh, we were able to uh, to train around uh, almost 4,000 uh, his his care workers uh, in uh, five years. Uh, the current grant is called the Makazane Rwanda, which which means to sustain. And uh, uh, the most focus is uh, policy uh, policy support uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, evidence-based guideline development uh, for HIV, STI, Hep, Hep, Hep B and C, and also uh, we'll focus on uh, implementing, uh, supporting uh, the station, or, or which is called Arabic Guanda Biomedical Center, which is the operation or branch of this of AIDS. We support them to implement the new PEPFAR initiatives, including index testing, Distance testing, uh, PREP, uh, self testing, and uh, CBS. Uh, we have also uh, uh, an, another part of support uh, in terms of laboratory support, uh, laboratory information system uh, support, and also we are uh, supporting the Ministry of Health to, uh, to develop and implement uh, continuous quality improvement program. We also uh, we are mandated to develop. Uh, national e-learning platform, and uh, also uh, we uh, we we train uh, in care workers uh, in those uh, PEPFA initiatives, and we have already trained uh, uh, more than 700 uh, uh, staff. Uh, in terms of challenge, we have some of them, uh, including programmatic and financial. Uh, Challenge. Oh, one challenge is that you are a small team, quite uh, a high qualified small team, but uh, so that uh, uh, most of the time, Ms. Office is uh, uh, requesting us to participate in different activities, uh, including those who are not really <laughs> funded. Uh, I think the same thing happened for Nigeria, to uh, understand and to. And we also we are at the last mile of HIV epidemic control. Uh, Rwanda is uh, about to, uh, do, you know, to, to control HIV epidemic, the, the 1993-1990 are uh, almost done. And uh, uh, we have also a high uh, staff turnover uh, in this office setting, uh, so that when, when you train people, they just leave and you have to retrain again. So it is a challenge. That's why also uh, many of uh, uh, requested us to, to support a, a new learning platform. We have, uh, unfortunately for this moment, uh, a limited technical capacity, but uh, with support of uh, UMB Central, we will be able to, to deliver. Uh, we have also uh, a big a challenge in terms of data sharing agreement. We are working on that to make sure that we can access because we don't have, we don't implement on site, so we don't have uh, uh, programmatic uh, data. Uh, we, we need to use the, the data from this office. Also, uh, we don't address for this time, or we don't have uh, uh, addressed already uh, the NCDs in the context of HIV programming. We have also an uh, important financial uh, challenge uh, because uh, uh, we have already a, a, a small grant and uh, unfortunately the grant, as you know, is declining for different countries. Uh, and uh, so another issue is that we, uh, as you know, PEPFA have changed his, uh, his uh, uh, condition uh, for uh, uh, the, the grants uh, the, through the PEPFAR funding landscape has changed and the uh, money is mostly dedicated now 
uh, two or local NGOs, uh, but we were, we were working on that aspect as well. Uh, how we are going to address those uh, challenges? We, we think that um, in terms of um, new PEPFAR funding orientation, we are going to, de de to work on this diversification of funding sources and uh, new funding opportunities uh, because we have, we have on, on a single source of funding for this time and uh, also, also we are going to uh, adapt our organization of, or, or, or to the new uh, orientation. Uh, we are also, we think that we, we shall be able to support all the countries because the country now is about to control HIV epidemic and we are thinking to, uh, to support all the countries and the communities uh, surrounding Rwanda, uh, especially in the West African countries. And then, and I told you, we are almost here. Can you stand up, please? Uh, Rwanda team, can you stand up? So, we are only four uh, technical <laughs> uh, staff, and uh, we are doing that. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. It is a pleasure again to be here and share some uh, clinical trials experience with you uh, at CVD Mali. Then uh, CVD Mali, uh, it is not Malawi, I think. The <laughs> the <big chief. laughs> yeah, okay. Then CVD Mali was created uh, since 2001. Uh, after the agreement between uh, the Center for Vaccine Development here at the University of Maryland and uh, the Ministry of Health of Mali. And the mission of CVD Mali uh, are to quantify the burden of vaccine preventable diseases first and to uh, use, to evaluate the new uh, relevant vaccine in terms of uh, safety, immunogenicity, and uh, efficacy and to train the future Malian vaccinologist, vaccinologist. and uh, another, another mission is to bring the, the finding of those research, those evaluation to bring to the attention of the decision maker to uh, help to directly impact on the public uh, health policies. Uh, a good example of this action is the meningitis conjugate A vaccine, uh, which was developed at CVD Mali uh, under the direction of the meningitis vaccine project, MVP, partnership between WHO and NPAF uh, on 2001 to uh, help to eliminate the mening, mening, the cocal disease, meningococcal A disease in the meningitis belt in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, between 2004 and 2013, uh, CVD Mali did several uh, studies uh, on meningitis A conjugate uh, vaccine. And uh, we uh, enrolled at least 8,000 subjects aged from 9 months to 29 uh, years old. Uh, and to see the immunogenicity and safety and also to evaluate the the, the dose, the dose formulation for the pediatric uh, participant. And those uh, studies help uh, allowed to conduct to the licensure of this vaccine and using in the mass campaign. Then from 2004 till uh, 2017, more than 280 million people received this vaccine then the result help uh, uh, considerably to, to, to manage the meningitis A uh, disease in the meningitis belt. 
And in the same year, the, this vaccine was introduced in the Mali API uh, routine vaccination. Uh, the surveillance also done during this the period, the introduction until now, showed that there was no main A infection uh, in Mali. Uh, we had the same experience with the rotavirus uh, vac the vaccine against rotavirus uh, called Rotatec, which is a pentavalent vaccine uh, used on more than one at the, uh, uh, around uh, two thousand subject age from four to twelve uh, weeks of age, and we uh, concomitantly administered the vaccine uh, with the local API vaccination at uh, six. 10 and uh, 14 weeks uh, uh, of <coughs> age. Uh, and the result was very interesting and helped to, 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 to introduce this vaccine too in our local API vaccination since January 2014. We also did another study with the same vaccine uh, to see if we can uh, boost the uh, immunogenicity of the population of the, the, the infant with a second dose uh, given at nine months uh, of age and to see if there is uh, an interference between the Rotatec vaccine and the, uh, the, the given concomitantly with the local uh, with the API vaccine at nine months of age. Uh, again, we also did a, a very important trials on Ebola, Ebola vaccine on, started in October 2014. And it was a big challenge for us because it was the first time we did the phase one Ebola trial in Africa. And uh, we used the vaccine called Shepardonovirus type 3 uh, combined to Ebo, Ebola Z uh, glycoprotein. And we, we also given the uh, booster dose with the NVA, MVA uh, philo vaccine, which is the modified uh, vaccine in Ankara with many uh, type of uh, Ebola, uh, Ebola Z, S, and Marburg, uh, and other filoviruses used. Then also this study helped to 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 was an ex escalating uh, dose study to know the best dose to be used on the the, the next phases uh, of the development of this vaccine. And in 2015, we did a big uh, trial with uh, a, a a dose. Uh, showed during the first uh, phase of the trial. And we did it uh, with uh, GSK and we vaccinate more than 1,000 adults and more than uh, 500 children. And um, we also now currently we have another study uh, on the Ebola vaccine, a multicenter study with the Gu uh, Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone. Uh, on the uh, recombinant uh, vesicular stomatitis uh, vaccines with uh, versus adenovirus type 26, followed by the dose of MVA philo as booster uh, on children and uh, adult participants. Uh, another experience uh, is on maternal immunization started on 2011, uh, which was the phase four trial using uh, an inactivated uh, trivalent vaccine uh, and the uh, quadrivalent meningitis conjugate vaccine. We enrolled uh, more than 4,000 <coughs> pregnant women during the third trimester of uh, pregnancy to see if the children uh, can be protected after after delivery uh, against uh, uh, influenza uh, disease. <coughs> and the result of this study showed that uh, the protection can be found uh, with the infants 
until the first four months of, of life. <coughs> and uh, recently we started another trial with uh, the Boostrix vaccine on the pregnant woman uh, to see if the, the, the TDAP, the tetanus, uh, diphtheria, and pertussis acellular combined vaccine can protect the infant after birth against pertussis. And we compare this uh, vaccine with the, look of the, the routine vaccination, which is the TD, the, uh, the tetanus toxoid, uh, using act uh, actually in Mali. Then this study also is uh, on, on, ongoing. This is some publications we, we did with the different studies uh, we, we have, we have done. And uh, this is the team. It was not possible because the team is uh, more than six, uh, 60 uh, persons. Then I just like to show you a picture, a big picture of uh, the clinical department team. And I would like to acknowledge the CBD at the UMB of uh, University of Maryland, which uh, helped and support us, uh, I think, more than 18 years ago until now. And WHO and meningitis vaccine project, we, we, who initiated the meningitis vaccine, and the government of Mali, uh, and the Ministry of Health of Mali, its study population, and the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, which uh, helped always since starting until now, the financing all uh, the maximum of our projects. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Koch. Thank you. It really is an honor to be here to represent the Kenya team. All right. So currently in Kenya, I'll limit my presentation to the grants that we are currently implementing, but we'd like to bring to your attention that Kenya, um, UMB in Kenya has been in existence still um, since 2006. Um, we currently have six grants. Uh, we have two service delivery grants, which are really our biggest um, grant. So you notice that these grants are across all areas or all sectors of health system strengthening. We have the service delivery grant, which is, I don't know if this can be, yes. This program is a service deliver, delivery grant working in Nairobi, and then we have Pact Timiza, which works within the western side of Kenya, where the HIV prevalence is really high. Then we have um, PACE up at the top, which is a training grant working at a national level. We have Baresha Marlborough, which is a lab strengthening grant, again, working at national level, um, at county level, and at facility level to enhance lab support for HIV services and other health-related services. And then we recently got an NIH grant, which is the smoking cessation study amongst HIV-infected <coughs> populations. We also have TAFIC which is a research grant working with um, CDC and Cambry within, again, the western side of Kenya where the HIV prevalence is highest. Um, I'll quickly just look at the accomplishments of these grants. And this, as I said, I'm limiting these accomplishments to the last two and a half years. Um, we have been able to test 2.9 million adults within the two service delivery grants. Um, and these are pregnant, this include pregnant women, adolescents and children, and through this we've been able to identify 35,000 HIV infected individuals. 90% um, of whom are linked to HIV treatment services. Currently, the grants that we work in are supporting 91,334 HIV infected individuals who are receiving antiretroviral treatment within the facilities that we work in, 230 facilities in three counties. Amongst this, we have 3,000 children and 5,000 adolescents. Let me just say that these numbers are really significant. It represents about 8% of the HIV-infected 
individuals on antiretroviral treatment in Kenya. So UMB is a big player in the provision of HIV treatment in this country. Um, within this program, we've been able to achieve a very commendable high viral suppression rate of 95%, 95%. And I must say that the innovations that we have ad accomplished or adopted to do this have been recognized um, at PEPFA level and some of them have been uploaded to the PEPFA solutions for use by other countries. Our mother-to-child transmission rate is less than 2%. In fact, actually, very few children who've been through our programs from the beginning meaning from the time the mother um, from antenatal care have very few of them acquire HIV, but we do know that um, some mothers come very late in pregnancy or even after delivery. We still are able to achieve very low mother-to-child transmission rates of less than 2% at 6 weeks and less than 5% at 18 months. So in essence, really, our programs have been able to achieve elimination of mother-to-child transmission in HIV. We're very proud of this new program. Um, we have we can, the UMB program in Kenya was the first to set up a, with partnership with the Ministry of Health, to set up a methadone treatment, um, methadone clinic for people who inject drugs. And through these clinics, there are now two clinics, we have 1,800 people who inject drugs who have been provided with opioid substitution therapy with methadone. This has been in partnership with other departments within the UMB, the Department of Psychiatry, and I know Dr. Welsh is here. They've been very crucial in setting this clinic up. We have 10 labs that have been supported through the lab strengthening grant to get accredited, um, which is really, again, a very big achievement because it's quite a process to get this done. And two of these 10 labs are actually <coughs> national reference labs. The TB National Reference Lab and the HIV Reference Lab have been accredited through our interventions. We've also been able to work with the National AIDS and STI Control Program to develop a national HIV, HIV, na national integrated HIV training and advanced HIV training curricula. Again, um, which has really changed the training from the usual five or two week, 10 day training um, in a classroom setting to on job training so that service delivery is not interfering. Currently our program support about 1,936 healthcare providers who are currently hired directly by our programs and providing HIV services in health facilities. And this does not even include lay, lay providers. However, like many other programs, we are experiencing <coughs> challenges. Um, the change in funding landscape has really made funding very unpredictable. Um, often targets are the focus more than quality. And for a program that was really set up based on the quality of care, this has become sort of very difficult for us to do, you know, where you're looking at targets as compared to really the quality of care. Um, things change media, as my Nigeria colleague talked about, in terms of funding and scope, and now we see an increased preference by the PEPFA donor towards local indigenous organizations. That said, we are expected to deliver more with less, um, and so we are forced to really spread thin. The other thing is, um, for us in Kenya, we feel that we really have a narrow scope and donor portfolio. All our programs, as you've noticed from my presentation, are really around HIV programming um, and, and are all PEPFA funded except the recent NIH funded study. So really a desire to expand our, our funding portfolio beyond the usual. And so because of that, we feel, I think um, a lot of our staff will feel not fully optimized in terms of their capacity. Many times they're doing things that are very prescribed and therefore really the desire to expand and to do more um, really um, needs to be tapped into. However, that said, looking at the future for our programs, really looking at the last mile, we are under pressure to improve on our efficiency, so less money but more output. So efficiency in programming and recently really ramp ramping up our efforts towards HIV testing through partner, um, towards identification of HIV infected individuals through partner notification services. Um, looking at the residual HIV transmission in PMTCT, every child matters, so how do you reach that mother who is at risk of transmitting an infection to the child? Managing viral loads, especially amongst adolescents and children, who are, um, I think yesterday we went through the research around pregnant women and also children. So you find that many times when drugs are out, the lutegravir, for example, 
they're not available for pregnant women or for children. So they, we tend to have some optimal treatment for these populations. And then providing differentiated care models for the various populations based on their needs and retention, which has become an increasingly uh, is, is of increasing concern to us. As a country, we'd like to build our research and publication agenda. Again, we feel that people don't really know what we are doing and what we've done, and we want to get this out there. We'd like to be able to develop cohorts for future business development. When I think about UMB in Kenya, and having really probably followed cohorts for the last 15 years, um, and yet we, don't, um, we haven't done that well enough to be able to show really how HIV or treatment has behaved in the populations that we serve. And I talked about diversification of funding, which is what is of key priority for us as UMB in Kenya. So I'd like to thank my team. Um, I, I'm here representing a team, and I'd like to introduce my fellow leadership from CIB in Kenya, and I'd like them to ask them to stand. We represent so the CHEB Kenya directors, we represent 163 staff in four regional facilities, and so these are the program directors and the finance directors from the finance directors from the program. Thank you. The work we do is also about partnerships. Um, we work with governments, we work with other development partners, we work with communities and populations. And we're also privileged to be joined by Dr. Masi Karanja, who represents the Ministry of Health and has worked with us to develop the first methadone clinic that I talked about. I'd like to ask Mercy to stand up. She's been really instrumental. She's been instrumental in not only setting up the two methadone clinics that we have, UMB has been able to set up in Kenya, but also the other four that are available in other parts of Kenya. This partnership has been done or has been successful through working with the University of Maryland. Department of Psychiatry, um, through partnership with Dr. Weintraub and Welsh, um, and really just goes to show that there's a lot more that we can do in country if we enhance partnerships with other programs within the University of Maryland. So I'd like to thank the institution and the, the organizers of this committee for inviting us. Thank you very much. Dr. Abu is next. When we were in Kenya, we visited the methadone clinic, and it was quite an experience, uh, and how efficient it ran, et cetera. So um, if any of you are visiting, I urge you to also visit that clinic. Dr. Abu. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure again to be here. Uh, others have introduced their teams at the end. I would like to introduce them in the beginning. Uh, can you please stand up? Uh, we are bound with time, so any questions which might be directed to me, just direct them directly to them. <laughs> Brenna, Brenna, you stand. Don't run away from questions. <laughs> so thanks a lot. I represent uh, the team here together with him, and uh, I come from Tanzania. And uh, I would like to start by telling you the grants. Others have talked about the grants which they have currently, but I'd like to take you a bit behind with the history of uh, grants in Tanzania. Uh, 2006 is when uh, UMB started uh, working in, in Tanzania, and uh, we implemented an AIDS, a, a grant called AIDS Relief, uh, which we, it was a consortium with uh, CRIS, IMA, uh, futures group currently known as Palladium, and we were the technical lead where we supported approximately 698 uh, ART and PMTST PM facilities. I uh, initiated over 100,000 patients uh, on treatment <laughs> with uh, remarkable viral uh, suppression of over 89%. This was based on the study which we conducted during our program. Uh, mortality rate was as low as uh, 13 uh, percent and uh, uh, retention rate was uh, over 75 percent. This grant ended in 2011 and it was totally funded approximately at uh, 24 million US dollars uh, by the end of the grant. The next grant which started in 2011 and took us to 2016 was called LEAD grant which was also a care, care and treatment grant uh, delivering at facility level. We were supporting four regions uh, this had an element of uh, transition to local partner. 
this was when the stories of transitioning to local indigenous organizations started. So the grant was written with an element of transitioning. We were still supporting the same facilities with the same numbers, but we kept on uh, giving away one region after every one or two years to the end. And in uh, 2016, 2011, we also implemented an HIV drug surveillance. This was a task order uh, by CDC to Westat, and we were partners in that, and we were conducting an HIV uh, drug resistance surveillance in 15 health facilities uh, scattered in Tanzania, uh, funded at approximately 250,000 US dollars. By the way, lead grant was funded approximately at $17.5 million. And uh, also we implemented TB grants, two TB waves, uh, wave two and wave three, uh, with, with an aim of increasing case detection of TB. We were uh, testing TB uh, in uh, these mining areas and we were targeting uh, local healers, local traditional healers, where we conduct uh, targeted uh, increased case detection and uh, we managed to increase case detection in the region which we supported by 38% from a previously reported. Uh, we also uh, demonstrated that gene expert machines could be used in uh, resource-limited settings, and we were among the first one. It was an implementation uh, science, sort of a small uh, study within the grant, and in this, we were actually targeting HIV-positive patients who we found difficult to uh, diagnose TB. So we subjected them to TB, I mean, to gene expert. And after uh, our, our project, the national uh, screening criteria for TB changed now, uh, bringing all HIV-positive patients to go through gene expert instead of the usual uh, sputum slide. Um, Rich project, this is the one which is currently implemented. As you can see, we, uh, as UMB in Tanzania, managed to be privileged to work at facility level, and now we're working at uh, above site. This is a technical assistance grant, uh, which we are providing technical assistance to government of Tanzania, Minister of Health, mainly, uh, local partners, which I believe we have, uh, as part of our program, we have local partners who are currently in this room attending IPEP grant. Do we have people from Amref here? Would you please stand up? Are you the only one? Um, and we have, uh, we have MDH. Uh, Anna Karabu, please stand up. Where is Shabu? So these are colleagues from a local indigenous organization which are attending IPEP here. Uh, we started that program from last year and uh, we currently continue with, with that. They, we, we bring them here for like three, uh, three weeks to be around. We are currently also supporting uh, CQI, uh, Continuous Quality Improvement in uh, Selected Health Facilities, uh, directly at facility level in 118 facilities. These are CDC priority facilities. Uh, we conduct capacity building in the whole country through ECHO, and we are the uh, ECHO coordinating uh, partner in Tanzania and we sit in the National uh, Steering Committee for ECHO. Um, we also uh, have been uh, blessed to be working with, again, with the AMREF team. AMREF is a prime and we are uh, sub to a uh, health delivery grant, which uh, we have specific areas which we are implementing, which is uh, TB, HIV, uh, continuous quality improvement in pediatrics. AMREF is uh, a prime in this. And uh, this has started last year, 2018, and it will end in 2023. <laughs> so uh, this, uh, the care, care or oh, service delivery grant is funded at 1.8, we're receiving from AMRIF, while uh, the REACH grant is currently approximately has been funded so far at 12.5 million, and we're in our third year. Um, this, this is a quick, uh, uh, how the current grant, the rich grant, which is a technical assistance, has been increasing. The funding has been going up, of course, not, uh, not out of nowhere, as uh, my colleagues have mentioned, that they come with uh, consequences of, you know, they keep changing the scope every day. We are very few, and we are pulled in 10 regions uh, over Tanzania, but we also provide technical assistance to the government and uh, the uh, CDC, I mean, uh, PEFA interagency team. This is where we work. That's the map of Tanzania. The dark green is where the prevalence is high. 
the stars uh, show you where we actually are located or where we provide technical assistance to, including where we are working at service delivery. Uh, that is the sequence of uh, starting from 2016, how we've been increasing. Uh, that will come to explain later on part of the challenge when the grants end. So the, um, the four staff is what we ended from the AIDS Relief Lead Grant. We uh, reduced the number of staff and it became four. And when we were starting a new grant reach, we started with four and quickly went to 12, 17, and currently we're at 58. Uh, and we hope uh, as we get more scope with what we might be going higher. I'll give a snapshot of uh, what is happening with the uh, service delivery grant. This is a, a TB. That's the baseline data for, for the TB portion. It's indicating how uh, the situation was when we started uh, uh, at, at that several regions, which were working on two, two, one, one region in Tanzania mainland and two uh, islands of Zanzibar. And it's uh, giving a snapshot of how uh, we are screening for TB and we find eligible patients and what is the challenge uh, you get. For example, you have a um, eligible for TB, well, approximately 12,786. Only 25% of those will be initiated in IPT. So IPT initiation has been a challenge, as well as now we find that I, I, IPT completion is becoming also a challenge. But as well, the uh, finding of uh, those who are screened, uh, to be screened positive, uh, very few, as study would suggest. So that has been a challenge. And, uh, here, I'll show you the uh, part of a, of a, you know, intervention of how things have been changing within this facility, uh, one facility, from the time we started uh, to what we are doing now. It's going high, that's just up to February. Uh, currently, we're at 68%. Um, this is part of a rich project of what we are implementing. That's a, uh, it's, a it's an app which uh, the team created uh, to show you quality improvement projects which are happening at facility level. Uh, we know in, in Tanzania, as, as well as many countries, you need to have a, a, a SES form, a standard form for uh, filling in quality improvement projects or activities which are happening at facility level. And the only way you'll be able to know what is happening is by you visiting the facility and looking at those papers uh, physically. But our team was creative to create an app which is uh, Android-based, uh, where these uh, you know, uh, projects are filled in, in those app, and the team can visualize that wherever they are and uh, support uh, facility level uh, intervention or uh, improvement of quality of care. For, uh, we have an HMIS team which has created uh, a couple of tools also. Uh, this is a, we call it monthly portal, where we created to be able to receive data every month. Uh, we created for our use, uh, particularly in plan to support uh, the partners, which could use that to monitor their data on a monthly basis. It has been positively hijacked by CDC, now it's sort of a PEFA uh, tool. <laughs> Because now they, they, they dictate the changes and they monitor it and all partners are currently uh, reporting to that on a monthly basis. Uh, but it's located in our facility, in our office, in our server, and we are the ones who are running that. We created a tool called the Data Analysis Company. This is uh, supporting partners or facility level staff or whichever staff to conduct analysis beyond the usual available uh, information which is, is available at uh, facility within the CTC2 database. And then we have a DDIU real-time. The country uses DHIS2 to report uh, everywhere, but it's been challenging for them to follow up where they are under-reporting or uh, wrong reports are uh, submitted. And this is uh, a tool which has enabled the managers to quickly pinpoint where challenges in the reports are and they could uh, support that facility or you know correct the uh, the report and this is what is used to report to conduct the, all the you know assessments and uh, uh, to in, in order to order for example drugs or to give uh, the, the current status of HIV within the country um, we are also conducting capacity building as I mentioned earlier through echo uh, data demand and information use where we train these managers regional health management teams and then we also take part in the site uh, improvement through monitoring system with CDC. 
We've conducted beautiful uh, GIS mapping to show where the hotspots for HIV infection are, where the uh, uh, currently patients are coming from, where uh, you could calculate distribution of healthcare workers versus the burden of loss to follow up versus the burden of, of disease. These are the tools which our, our team has been conducting. And this GIS mapping is currently supporting community partners to target where they're sending, uh, they're sending their staff to conduct testing. Challenges, majority of them have been mentioned, particularly when it comes to the funder. Uh, but I, I would like to talk about uh, business development. Uh, other programs have been highly funded. Uh, for us in Tanzania, the issue of preference to local indigenous organization has been uh, damaging us. This is just a couple of uh, grants which we put a beautiful or very strong application, but we lost uh, the grant and they were awarded to uh, local partners because local partners start putting any uh, application with 15 points ahead. So you need to have get 100 and make sure that they get less than that for you to get 115. So it's sort of challenging to be able to beat uh, that competition. And I think this, all, all of us will be talking about the same. Um, I, the other thing is we are looking at a future in acquiring the local entity status. Uh, this uh, well dreaming, we have moved uh, remarkably at the moment. Uh, since the last couple of months, I would say, uh, we are moving towards that. Uh, we are also looking as well as Kenya to become multi-grant uh, team, but as well to diversify funding. You see we are funded mostly by uh, PEFA, and uh, we've got WHO, but that was a small fund, $1 million each. And then uh, the task order also was at 250000 so we'd like to expand, get other funds from, um, from other donors, um, and as well as increase our funding level. I understand Rwanda has been saying they have little fund, but for us, we would, we'd like to go more, uh, approximately more than 15 million, or even more. Uh, we are looking forward to studying these uh, you know, educational programs, which will be affiliated with the University of Maryland. We've done some, uh, some work with uh, Virginia. I think we've met. Or what did I touch? Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to revamp our research unit and conduct collaborations within, uh, with the local universities. We have a memorandum of understanding with all the universities in, in, in Tanzania currently and looking forward to putting down uh, some research proposals. That's the team. Uh, I think he is here. JK, will you stand again? Uh, Laurent and uh, where is Patientela? Patience, please. And uh, Jenna, Brock, stand up. And uh, that's the team I traveled particularly for this meeting. But as I mentioned earlier, there are other members of the team. Tina, please stand up. And GK. Thanks. picture, a group picture, but this is an old picture when we have very few of us, now there's more of us. This is a team which is implementing Afya Kamilifu. This is me pushing him because he was hiding this tiny little girl here. You can see that. So I wanted him to move so that he could, she could also be visible. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Once again, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as I mentioned, I think this is uh, my first time actually to be at UMB. So I'm going to talk about uh, the work that Malaria Alert Center is actually doing. Um, Malaria Alert Center is uh, a unit um, within the College of Medicine. Uh, the College of Medicine itself is a uh, the only medical school uh, in Malawi. So just a, as a matter of uh, background, a uh, small country, Malawi, um, about 17 million people, um, the waste indicators, 
uh, in infant mortality and under five, as you can see, most of that is actually driven by malaria. So in Malawi, almost everyone is at risk of malaria uh, as of now. Uh, there is increasing incidence actually of uh, malaria as by WHO. And uh, last year, I'm blown about six million cases uh, of malaria. So a little bit of uh, a background to the center itself. It was uh, established uh, in 2001 with funding from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, mainly to respond to the high burden of malaria itself. Uh, as I said, it's part of the University of Malawi. Our focus really is on training health workers, and which we've done thousands of those, uh, doing operational research, uh, and doing uh, M&D. So the reason why I'm here uh, is I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the three platforms that we have, which I think uh, could interest some of the faculty here at the University of Maryland. Um, and students as well that uh, might be interested to do malaria research. So one of those platforms actually uh, is a CDC cooperative agreement that we have been running uh, with the CDC for the last 15 years. Uh, under this, uh, um, the main goal of that uh, cooperative agreement is really to support the Ministry of Health in developing evidence-based policies uh, and within the last five years, we've been at the center of uh, directing actually policy or providing policymakers with the evidence within Malawi. So we've done a, a lot of drug efficacy studies. Uh, we've done testing of new drugs for malaria, especially malaria control in pregnancy. We've looked at new diagnostics uh, and advised uh, the country appropriately. But more importantly, we've been working with the Malawi government really to look at the issues with to do with monitoring the effectiveness of bed nets. As all of you know, bed nets are actually the critical part uh, of malaria control and we are seeing quite a, a bit of a challenge there in terms of their effectiveness as insecticide resistance increases. And we've been doing a lot of testing as well of new generation of bed nets because we've got these experimental huts uh, as part of the setup uh, at Malaria Alert Center. Uh, we have just uh, recompeted again for another cooperative agreement and uh, uh, we will be funded again in 2019 for the next five years uh, uh, with uh, about an $8 million uh, grant. Uh, I think that's a huge opportunity for those people that are interested, uh, especially to do social uh, science research, health systems research, because most of this work is really sitting down with the Malawi government and finding out what exactly they would want to be studied and us fitting into that. Uh, the second branch that I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the International Center for Malaria uh, Research, International Centers of Excellence for Malaria Research. Some of you might have heard about this in 2009, NIH actually wanted to create 10 uh, centers across the globe. Uh, University of Malawi together with the University of Maryland here, uh, Miriam Rofa in particular, and other partners within the, uh, the U.S. We competed for this uh, and uh, we were awarded in 2010 for a seven-year grant which was completed and recompeted again and we uh, again have been funded uh, to do work up to 2024. So the drive for this one So the drive for this one is really to look at the, uh, why malaria is stubborn, uh, stubbornly entrenched in Malawi. As I mentioned, uh, I think if you look at the pattern of malaria within the sub-Saharan region, you find that actually within that region malaria is decreasing, but Malawi, as WHO is saying, is actually on the increase. So one of the things that we are particularly interested in is looking again at the uh, insects that treated bed nets and the how that relates to, uh, the, how the effectiveness that would relate to things to do with the uh, insecticide resistance. We are looking at the common factors or risk factors for malaria, especially looking at other things like behavior uh, drivers of malaria within that setup. Again, this is a big grant, 
uh, where Miriam Lofa, who is uh, here with, with us today, is uh, actually supporting us in doing some of the work that is quite complicated in terms of looking at the reservoirs of malaria within that setup. Uh, uh, who is getting bitten by malaria, who is keeping malaria, and who is transmitting. Uh, so building capacity at least within the setup of Malawi. Uh, the third grant, uh, again a platform that I wanted to talk about, is the malaria vaccine uh, implementation project. I'm sure some of you might have heard about the RTSS, WHO in 2017 uh, selected a few countries in, in, Mal in, in Africa to implement the RTSS. Malawi happens to be one of those countries. Uh, again, we competed uh, as Malaria Lead Center uh, to be the lead evaluators uh, for this and the, we are actually the lead evaluator in Malawi. So the main thing that we are looking at is actually operational feasibility uh, of the vaccine, especially the four doses, how it's going to be delivered. Uh, we are also looking at the impact of the vaccine itself and doing surveillance as well uh, for adverse events, especially those that were highlighted uh, as, uh, as key uh, during the trials. So we're looking at meningitis and cerebral malaria. Um, again, this, I think, is a large opportunity, it's a huge opportunity for those that are interested uh, in looking at vaccine-related studies. Uh, it's a $6 million grant that is going to run from at least this year for the next six years. Uh, with Miriam, again, we have been working in trying to find a way of how we can leverage on this platform in order for us to study other things. So recently we applied to the NIH to get some more money for us to look at things that WHO might not be interested in, uh, things to do with transmission. Uh, again, I just wanted to bring this to the attention of people that are in here, especially those that might be interested to use this kind of platform in order for them to answer some more questions. In terms of challenges, I think we, some of those have already been mentioned already. But the main thing I think for us is to do with the, uh, the small unit that we have. It's about 60 people uh, that are working within the College of Medicine. Of course, there is the advantage of the wider College of Medicine. But for the unit itself, I think the key issues is for us to be able to identify, uh, attract, and at least to retain the key staff. And more importantly, people are interested in, in training. Uh, so for us to be able to do that, I think it becomes an issue. But again, we've been working here with UMB to try and see how best we can retain staff within Malawi. So I would want as well to report on the grant that we have uh, that is training biostatisticians uh, to, to help with data management and this training as well. Uh, Jimmy Verreta, who is the uh, here at UMB. I don't know whether he's within the group, so he can stand up for people to see. Not within the group. Uh, and uh, an entomologist as well uh, that we are training to be part and parcel of that team. So the reason why I wanted actually to, to, to talk about this, uh, the three platforms is really to encourage people, especially from UMB, that are interested in global health. I think within these three platforms, most of them are going to run for the next six to seven years. There is a huge opportunity for people to come in, uh, pitch studies, pick it back on these platforms, and be able to answer questions that might be there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nathanda. Dr. Nathanda. Rate, I think, as most people in this room know, is very high. We have one of the longest HIV treatment programs, have at, least got, at least public HIV treatment programs in Africa, which started in 2002. And I'll just talk about the, the, the grants that um, we are currently, uh, we currently have in Mugon. Um, UMB has been in Mugon as since um, April 2015, so it's a relatively new player um, in Mutuama. 
but it is nonetheless the biggest uh, can treatment partner uh, for CDC in Madonna. We have two, we have, we have two grants. Um, there's a, a capacity building grant for can treatment. This is uh, mostly technical assistance. And that is an approximately $25 uh, million dollar grant that will uh, elapse uh, in next year. We also have a community uh, HIV treatment uh, services grant um, and also uh, with, with community uh, treatment support. And that is supposed to run through 2022. Um, however, a part of this grant has been suspended by, PEP, by PEPFA um, so that it, we can focus only on community treatment support and suspend uh, community uh, uh, treatment services, which, which I'll explain in a little bit. So in terms of some of our results, you'll see that for our community testing grant, um, in, in the time that we've had the grant, since April 2017, we've identified about uh, uh, 4,337 400, 4, uh, uh, new cases. And, and the, the, the interesting thing there is that our yield has generally been around 3%, which is a little bit lower than the yield that we see at the facility level, which is usually around 5 uh, or 6 or 6%. Um, we've, also, uh, we've also, if you look on, on, on your, uh, to be your right, you'll see that we just, we're just showing you here um, the percentage of of males, basically talking about who we are, we are really reaching, you will see that we are reaching 62% males when we do community HIV testing versus 38% females. And this you will see later that is actually is actually flipped when you go to into facilities, so that it's the other way around in terms of who we find. And you will also see that we, the men are coming in, we're finding them later, so anywhere between the ages of 30 and 44. And, and but the good thing is we're actually finding the men because when at, 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 at facility level, we tend to find more women. So again, this is just um, a slide just showing you the linkage to treatment. Uh, for our community testing program, you will see that the overall linkage was 71%, but what we have found is that over time, um, those, are then, those identified in the community are slower to come forward for treatment, but eventually they do, they do come forward. And, as, and again, you can see here that we have a, approximately 60% 60, 60 of, of our cases identified in the community and, and, and linked to treatment actually being male. So the other grant, which is the care and treatment grant, um, I, I've put here just um, a summary of, of some of our accomplishments, and this is really as of the end of Q2 uh, of this uh, financial year. So this would be the period from uh, January 1 to uh, the end of March 2019. And you'll see that with uh, PMTCT HIV testing, we are virtually testing 100% of our women. And in this particular cohort, it would have been about 6,000 6, women. And we haven't put it here, but 22% of them uh, are actually HIV positive. In terms of linkage to treatment um, for prevention of mother to child transmission, um, we, we are, again, we are putting almost everybody on, on treatment, and, and, but our, our uptake for early infant diagnosis is a little lower than we would like it to be, even though our mother-to-child uh, 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 transmission rate is actually below 1%, which is a really important, um, one of the important criteria for elimination, so that we're actually beginning to see the effects of elimination. It's, it's very rare now to find uh, young you know, like a, a baby that is HIV positive in Mutual. So that most of uh, our, 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 who used to be children are now in the adolescent stages, and, and I think we're very, very close to, to elimination. In terms of linkage to treatment, um, this is an area that we have had mixed results in. 
about 87 percent, well, our leverage rates are 87 percent, um, and with our fast track rate really defined as people were able to put on treatment in the first seven days after diagnosis being at 72 percent. Now there's a caveat to our latest treatment because Botswana was, was originally, at least historically, fully funded by the Botswana government. In fact, the Botswana government still funds about 70% of the cost of the treatment program. But this resulted in the politics that it was difficult then to treat foreign nationals, some of them who, who immigrate across uh, the border, in particular from, Zimbabwe, from the Zimbabwe side. And so this is something that has been carried with us for quite, quite a number of years now, and it's, it's actually still the case, and we're trying to change that. This is unique, because in, in most other uh, countries that are receiving pet for assistance, we don't have this phenomenon. So this is why I was saying, and so all the foreign nationals we've identified, which are approximately 10% of the population of, of, of our new cases, uh, are actually not being put on treatment. And so this is this is a policy area that we need to work on. In terms of retention, we have had historically really great retention. So you can see that for the period um, January to March 2019, that our, our retention rate was 95, 95.4%. In terms of viral load coverage, again, this is a program that from its inception in 2002, actually utilized uh, uh, viral load testing and and our our coverage is at about 96 96 percent but also our suppression rates are, are, are close to 96 97 percent so in terms of viral load coverage i think we we are doing just fine and so who are we enrolling in treatment this very quickly i think that the most interesting thing about this slide really is that is what I referred to earlier. So you see that 64% in general, if you look on, on the left, you'll see that this is now the sort of all-time uh, uh, total current on treatment as of uh, the second quarter, or as of March uh, 2019. You'll see that the total number of people we have on treatment is, is, is a little over 150,000, which, which are under our care. Uh, which, which are under our, uh, the, the care of our, our grants. And this is approximately 50% of all the people on, on ART in the country. So, so while we're a new player as UNB, we're also a very significant player. But you'll see what I was referring to, um, that when you now look at the overall picture, you'll see that 64%, uh, uh, at least for, for the total current on treatment, are female and 36% are men. And so there's always been uh, uh, this, this concern that we have a, a gap when it comes to treating men. And in fact, you'll see from the earlier slides that um, the community program was reaching men. And, 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 but what is interesting is that if you look at now the newly initiated, uh, not just the total, uh, the newly initiated from the, from the period of October 2018 to March 2019, you'll see that we're closing the gap a little bit so that 56% this time were, were, were female and 44% were men. So it's something we're doing in the programming that is reaching more men. In terms of our challenges, I think our, our challenges are really focused, the, fo the challenges that we put on here are really focused on achieving epidemic control. You can imagine with a, a small population that almost has already 15% of the population uh, being on, uh, on on ART and also um, in, you know a small economy that is actually spending upwards of 140 million dollars a year from government coffers um, on 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 HIV. That this idea of achieving epidemic control is extremely important to us. And you see some of our challenges there. There's uh, policy issues I talked about about the treatment of non of non citizens. We've had public modification policies that uh, didn't make it very easy to uh, really emphasize the use of anonymity um, and so didn't make it very easy to, to really reach the most at risk. We do need to obviously expand HRH given um, the magnitude of the problem and this is something that we, we have various, we're helping the government with, with various interventions. 
we do have a, 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 again a leaky cascade, and and really this is just you know trying to optimize the system so that when you get diagnosed, you get treated right away. And of course, we have some concerns with monitoring and, and evaluation, so that um, we, we really need to zero in on being more efficient in monitoring and evaluation because in that last mile, we do find that. Um, our ability to reach the people we need to reach is, is, is really very highly dependent on how good we are doing our monitoring. And so in terms of the future, again, the future is really here, at least as, as we present it here, is really focused on what happens after you, you achieve epidemic control because you still have about 18% of the population on ART. So what do you do? Well, one of the things that, uh, sorry, I'm not sure what I did here. One of the things that um, we, we, we are going to be really focused on will be uh, this building a national case-based surveillance system. Now, this is somewhat new. I think PEPFA is starting to talk about it in other countries as well. Certainly, our colleagues in Nigeria have, have come to help us, but we are really dead set on getting this done and rolled out very rapidly over the next three months. So this is really the future where we will bring together all the, 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 the databases that we have to, to really build this case-based surveillance system um, uh, to, to, to manage HIV going forward and hopefully to also expand that to other conditions as well. We do think that the government continues to need support. It, it, it is a relatively well-resourced government, but it is also a government that has many, many challenges like every other African government of unemployment and so many competing uh, priorities on, on their budget. And so we do think that they continue to need technical assistance and some targeted direct service delivery uh, assistance. Finally, um, we still believe there's a gap we don't know how big that gap is. We are doing a, a survey at the moment that I think will, will, will answer that question. But we do think finding men is going to be extremely important to not only achieve <coughs> epidemic control, but also keep them on treatment in order to sustain epidemic control. And, and, and again, um, like, like, like uh, the other countries, we're also beginning to, to talk about how we expand what we do. And, and even if we were just focused on the population that we're currently assisting, um, we would still need to look at this aging population and, and, and what the implications of non-communicable diseases are on this aging population that we currently have. So this is the team. Um, we, we actually are approaching 300 uh, uh, people, so we, we sampled uh, lucky few that <laughs> managed to make it here. I also do have uh, my team here, uh, the management team. So if everybody, uh, all of the team from Madonna can please rise. Um, so you see, so you see that, um, at, uh, Dr. Jarrell, I, I'm, uh, we are truly, we've truly localized globalization and internationalization because I mean, our management team, our director of technical services is from Kenya. Director of Finance and Admin is from Kenya, and our Director of Programs is from Nigeria. And we have a Senior Technical Advisor who's from the U.S., Sally. So, yes, that's it, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, right on time, back to Shannonburg. Well, I'm from uh, Zambia, and my last name starts with an S, so I'm used to being uh, last in presenting, but not least, hopefully. So, um, and unlike uh, my colleagues, they told me I only had six slides, so I either obediently or foolishly only have six slides. So, so anyway, that's kind of it. I, I've uh, been in Zambia for almost 15 years. I'm one of the few faculty members that never made a stop in Maryland and went straight from California to Zambia. Um, but I do pay taxes in Maryland, so you're benefiting from some of my efforts in Zambia. Um, Zambia is a landlocked country that's uh, in South Central Africa. It's a little bit larger than the state of Texas and has about 17 million people in it. 
It sits next to Malawi, so we're really interested in them getting control of their stubborn mosquitoes because they keep flying over to Zambia. <laughs> <laughs> so looking forward to that. Um, we have a generalized HIV epidemic that is impacting, uh, I think we have about the seventh highest prevalence in the world, so it's a, a major um, condition trying to deal with HIV in Zambia. Our staff is made up of about 230 individuals that are either employees of the University of Maryland or the Maryland Global Initiative Corporation Zambia uh, that employs both people in healthcare and in administration. We work in um, four provinces for the CDC. Our headquarters is in Lusaka, but we have multiple offices in other provinces and our staff is kind of spread across the country that way. We have four active grants right now. We've had several other grants in the past, but I'm not really going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about our four active grants. Our, our fourth one is, is like as of May 1st, thanks to Dr. Man Sharat and the successes they've had in Nigeria. Um, we're also doing a FIA study now in Zambia, and which is really, really exciting, and I'll talk about that in a second. Our, our, our first prime grant was uh, called SMOC, which is Stop Mother and Child Transmission. Nobody can pronounce it except for me. But, um, but anyway, it's a, a grant that started out as a PMTCT grant only, and then transitioned to a comprehensive care and treatment grant. And uh, it's now working in 330 facilities in the southern province, and we do both direct service delivery and technical assistance in those grants, so uh, in the, on that grant. And it's been um, kind of our hallmark grant right now. It's working on an 18-month uh, grant year because they gave us an extra time period in shiftiness, and it's about a $19 million reward for that particular 18-month period. The second grant we have is one called Z-Check, which is a Zambian Community HIV Epidemic Control for Key Populations. The focus of that grant is really to link communities in the facilities, and I'll talk in our accomplishments about, or achievements about what we uh, designed to help some of these grants be successful. But we're dealing primarily with priority populations, trying to find them in the communities and bring them into care. And we deal with adolescents, key populations such as men who have sex with men, transgenders, some IV drug users and prisoners and uh, really trying to get these outliers in, uh, of people that don't tend to come into the facility so readily, enroll them in care and keep them in care. Um, a grant that just started, it's uh, in its third year right now, or SMOC is in its fourth year right now of a five-year grant. And CIRCUITS uh, is just in the first year. It's the Community Impact to Reach Key and Underserved Individuals for Treatment and Response. Thank you very much, Cass Dr. Cassie Clausen, for coming up with that great name. And uh, he's designed a lot of our little uh, acronyms and, and, and uh, cartoons for these things. But it's also similar to ZCheck. It's focused on linking the community and the facility and addressing populations that are falling outside of normal care. With this award, CDC was really looking at where are the provinces that are underperforming in their ability to find patients and bring them into care and who are we going to choose to um, fix that problem? And they chose the University of Maryland and the application we put forth. And that grant has been hugely successful in its first year and actually exceeding all of its targets by identifying these key populations, bringing them into care, and helping them maintain in care. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Response, which is Xanthia 2020, uh, just started on May 1st. So we've got about a a five or six month period of scale up before the actual grant rolls in. And it's really uh, an exciting opportunity for the University of Maryland to expand the excellent work that they did in Nigeria and then prove that we can do it again. And as uh, Dr. Sharat will share, that CDC is really looking at our performance on this grant to, to really uh, establish UMB as a leader in this area of population surveillance. Some of the accomplishments um, I want to go over are really, um, when we started PEPFAR in 2004, I think we had the leadership of Dr. Robert Redfield, who's now the CDC director, but he really helped us understand that we needed to start with the end in mind. 
And so long before anybody was talking about epidemic control, we were thinking about epidemic control. And so we were thinking about what are the barriers to really help us get there. And he used to talk a lot about having the, the right first uh, regimen and using a care delivery system that would guarantee you success and the ability to keep people on treatment. And when I came to, to Zambia in 2004, all of Africa was using a therapy that was pretty much obsolete in the United States and Europe because of its heavy toxicities and the fact that that treatment option didn't really leave you options for the future. And so we worked very hard in Zambia uh, with our team to really convert to what became the established uh, first-line regimen for a decade in all of resource-limited settings. And Zambia was the first country to adopt that uh, drug therapy as standard treatment, which really matched what was going on in the United States. And it was really a turning point, not only for Zambia, for, but for much of Africa, in taking on a first-line regimen that would have utility for decades. And we continue to stay involved in those kind of activities. <laughs> the other thing we looked at, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, is you know how do you de develop a care delivery system that really helps meet uh, the needs. We completely understood that we can't build the infrastructure and the human resources necessary to achieve epidemic control um, just in facilities alone. I'll talk about that in a moment. The other great thing that I, I feel that I'm really, really proud of as our team is that we really invested in HIV advanced training. We initially started with training HIV specialists and then eventually bridged into a five-year Masters of Medicine in Infectious Disease and Internal Medicine. I'm very blessed to have two faculty members, both Infectious Disease doctors working in Zambia with me, and they've really spearheaded this work along with many of the other faculty members up in the room, Dr. Patel, Dr. Riedel, and several others that really helped us to be the premier educator in Zambia of uh, physicians in HIV and infectious disease medicine. And it's really rewarding to now to look at CDC, the Ministry of Health, and mul multiple other implementing partners and see University of Maryland fact people that we've trained in Zambia through the University Teaching Hospital that are now serving in leading roles in the country and really taking forth the philosophy and the strategies for implementing care and treatment um, through the models that we've developed and how we've trained them. Uh, I wanted to mention briefly the Community HIV Epidemic Control Model. As I mentioned, you just can't treat all the millions of people that need to be treated in, with facility care alone. So we developed these models that put a community worker in touch with a facility and really at the disposal of the facility to spread out uh, HIV testing, retention and care, and all these other aspects of, of epidemic control into the community and become a branch of the community. And before really differentiated service delivery models were ever being discussed as a strategy, we were already doing that. And now that's become the, the buzzword and how you get things done is through differentiated service delivery. And those are all things that we were working on in Zambia and developing uh, several years ago. Uh, SMOC Plus, as I mentioned, is a, uses community engagement to reduce mother to child transmission. Um, it expands targeted and index testing. We're considered the expert in Zambia on index testing and we're presenting papers at conferences um, in several places on index testing. Uh, Z-Check utilizes community peer supporters, so we've hired adolescents and men who have sex with men and female sex workers to actually be community volunteers and reach into their community. And we've also uh, been the leader of PrEP in Zambia through that particular grant and leading the way and developing pre-exposure prophylaxis strategies for Zambia. And in circuits, again, using the same kind of models with a much more focused approach to reach successes and now reaching into prisons as well. Uh, the challenges we've had is that, uh, as other presenters have mentioned, CDC keeps changing the playing field. And so with the SMOC grant, um, we initially started out as a PMPCT grant, but every year they've been shifting us into different facilities and districts. So we start, we build up, and then they shift us to a new place, and we have to start all over again and build up. So it's been kind of a waste of some of our resources, but it's also been frustrating to have to keep restarting over and over again. 
And CDC changes their priorities, and when they change their priorities, that becomes an emergency. So whatever you're working on uh, longitudinally becomes lo dropped by the wayside, and you have to shift your focus to what is on their agenda at, at that particular time. The Ministry of Health has also had a lot of turnover, and so there's not been uh, consistent leadership within the ministry, and so it's been difficult to have a sustained and long-lasting vision within the Ministry of Health, and so trying to get policies and procedures changed is often very laborious when you're working with an organization that is in flux and changing all the time itself. In Zambia, when I got there in 2004, we had an electronic uh, data record and called Smart Care, um, but it's still not completely spread in all the facilities, and so we're doing a hodgepodge of, of paper data and electronic data collection, and there's been multiple people that have managed smart care, and so the challenges of having that not be a completely working data collection system has been challenging as well. And there's kind of a, what I say is a, long, a, a lack of a long-term vision among the funders, CDC, and the stakeholders for how we actually get um, epidemic control and develop sustainable solutions for global health. And so they're looking at very short-sighted um, impact and measuring that impact in shorts, but they're not really looking for long-term um, results. One of the examples of that is we're doing a transition, just as we're getting close to HIV epidemic control, we're doing a transition to local partners who aren't uh, haven't really got us to the point that we're in, and so there's a concern that they may not have the capacity to actually keep the momentum going to achieve epidemic control. And then, as everybody's mentioned, the stability of funding sources has also been a major issue. The future, I, I think, is really uh, wrapped around developing strategic partnerships across a very broad discipline. Um, HIV care um, in terms of HIV is important, but there's other emerging diseases we have to look at, and has been mentioned HIV and aging is going to be a problem. There's still more people that are impacted by malaria, hypertension, and diabetes and HIV in most of our countries, and we've got to look at those uh, things. And to make real lasting changes, it takes collaborations with people that are experts in policy and law. It was really exciting yesterday. Um, as we met with the law school and s saw potential for collaborations and trying to help um, our Zambian team better understand how to make lasting impact. And then health management is a huge issue in, in Africa and in Zambia in particular where the, the uh, skill sets to actually do effective health management are not always in place. I think it's important that, and this has started to happen, where we take some non-grant resources and invest them in building infrastructure in our country and doing demonstrations of what can be accomplished, and those will lead to further grant funding in the future, and then we're moving in that direction. And then working from a position of service, but with a really clear purpose and vision to where we want to go. Again, as we started in Zambia, we had an end in mind with HIV, and I think we need to do that with global health care as well. One of my dreams is to have global health clinics, which would be demonstration project of what quality care actually looks like in our country, so people can come and see and experience um, a really good managed health system. And my team, if, as I call out your name, if you'd stand up and then you can clap for everybody at the end, Dr. Lati Achambo, please stand up. He's an assistant professor here at the University of Maryland. He's the chief of party for stay, uh, stay standing, stay standing. Wait, no, wait, wait till they get all up, and then you can save yourself uh, six claps. Anyway, uh, he's the uh, chief of party for Z Check, and he's also our training director, Dr. Cassidy Clausen. He's an assistant professor here at the University of Maryland. He's the chief of party of circuits. He's our technical director. One of the other successes that we've done is he's been key in bringing um, exchange visits for people from the University of Maryland into Zambia and developing some antimicrobial uh, issues that we've been dealing with at UTH. Dr. Inye Skashangora, he's our chief of party for, for uh, SMOC, our largest grant, and he was his chief of party for ZCheck for a long time, an extremely hardworking individual that's been key to the success of that grant and why we've gotten continued funding for that grant. Uh, Lillian Mungaluba, you here? Yeah, Lillian's over in the corner there. She's our 
Director of Finance and Administration. She's what allows us to keep working. She makes sure the money's there and all the logistics and teams work together. Without her, we would not be doing much at all. Dr. Masangwa Sanjani is our Deputy Technical Director. Dr. Solanji Savili is our Senior Medical Technical Advisor. Ina Kafunda is our Program Manager for SMOC, and she's been our most senior Program Manager and really been trained a lot of our other Program Managers and helped us be successful with Program Management. And so these are the guys that make me look good and just give them all a round of applause. Shannonberger, I think you could see the, what uh, Dr. Uh, Olson said in her keynote address that the reach of UMB is far when it comes to global health. So I want to thank all of you for these wonderful presentations. Uh, I think, uh, where's Dr. Ward? Is Dr. Ward yes, here? we have a break now. We have a break now, he says. So thank you all very much. Fifteen minutes, he says. Thank you. Thank you.